guess it can be an art. <laughs> um, it's a, I see it more as a craft. I mean, it's more about craftsmanship and, and building something that's going to last. It's, it's great that this place is very much a collaboration. I mean, most of what we do, we are binding pages that people bring us, which means they've already spent months or years writing the story, doing the family history, creating whatever the content of this book happens to be. And they are, they've put their, their heart and soul into it, and so it's their baby, and we get to basically finish it for them. And when they come back and they see it, and it's a, a complete, finished, real book, they can't really believe it and we have many happy customers because most of those are happy occasions. People are happy to finish their dissertation, their 12-year project. Um, it's, it's great. The customers we have are really great. They invest a lot of themselves into the project before we ever get it and that makes it rewarding. My name is Tedra Ashley Wanamuller. I'm a professional bookbinder. I've been a bookbinder full-time for 18 years now at a small two-person bindery in East Central Illinois, the Lincoln Book Bindery. I also have my own online business doing custom orders for people all over the world, and I enjoy collaborating with my customers on those. I get a lot of input from my customers about the type of book they want, how they want the outside of the book to look, and um, I try to get as close to what they want as possible. I like to try to create the book that my customer wants within my ability. <laughs> Usually we can work out something that we're both happy with. I've had some customers that have a very distinct idea where they send me uh, rendered PDF files of exactly what they want the cover to look like and sometimes I'm able to make it pretty much exactly like that, sometimes with a few adjustments. Sometimes we make um, custom boxes for rare books where the, you're not to touch the book itself because it's most valuable in its current form, even if that form isn't that great, and we will make uh, boxes to hold that book to protect it. Um, the, some are collectors, some more though, we get just uh, people bringing in their, their sentimental books. The family Bible, the family cookbook, a book they had as a child that they want to read to their grandchildren, so the repairs tend to go more along those lines. <laughs> I have other customers that say, do whatever you want, which is also wonderful, <laughs> but usually there's somewhere in the middle there, there's some guidance, they want a certain theme, certain color, certain look, a uh, certain price level, and all of those go in, all those factors go into it. I had a college professor in, and I was earning my photography degree and he gave us a project about images in sequence and insisted that we do that project in our own book which he taught us how to bind and that was probably the first time that I made a book by hand start to finish. I enjoyed it and after that I took a summer job at the Indiana University Main Library just in the conservation department, not rare books, just regular books and we repaired the books from the stacks that needed repairing. Uh, students didn't get to do a lot, but I got to see a lot there. And after working in photography for a few years, I decided to change careers and the job became available at the Lincoln Book Bindery. I had been coming over here to have Chris, the owner, cut materials for me because he has this awesome giant paper cutter. And um, I was making books at home for friends and family members and so I kind of used him for his equipment and when he needed an employee he asked if I wanted a job and it has worked out very well. <laughs> I'm Christopher Hone. I'm the owner of Lincoln Book Bindery. I started working here as a student when I was at the University of Illinois in 1972 so I've been at this for over 42 years. And when I first started doing this we were getting dissertations on, on carbon paper or onion skin uh, because in 1972, almost nobody had a photocopier, um, and 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 we were getting you know typed original copies of dissertations and family histories and so forth. Uh, so as that technology came in, it was it was a huge benefit for this business that people could easily make multiples of something. So then we started getting instead of getting one thesis, we got five theses. Uh, and, or instead of one family history, we got 10 or 20 of them. And, and then came personal computers. And people started asking me right off the bat, um, boy, what do you think about personal computers? Because, you know, like, the, the books are going to become obsolete. And initially, uh, 
That was not the case. Initially, it liberated all of the frustrated writers in the world. It became very easy to sit down at your computer and, and compose that, that personal memoir or your poetry or whatever it was you wanted to do, and in fact set it up in type that looked quite nice and print it out on your own printer if you wanted to. And, and people had the power to make a book on their, on their desk. Um, so we ended up with more work than ever uh, as a result of that, and I think it peaked in the 90s and the early 2000s. But once the Kindle was introduced, uh, that was a game changer, and I knew it. In fact, uh, as soon as it was introduced, I bought one and gave it to my wife, partly because I knew she would enjoy it, but also partly because I wanted to see one. I wanted to get an idea of what the competition looked like. And as soon as I saw it, I thought, this, this will change everything. Um, and and it, I don't think of it as the enemy. I just think of it as the inevitable transition to the next thing. Um, and, and we can't stop that. It's changing a lot, and books are disappearing. The, the way that people used to use books is changing. I can tell you that... Um, uh, let me say that uh, Ted has already mentioned that, that we've done a lot of theses and, and we used to do magazines that disappeared first. Um, we don't see very many periodical binding orders anymore. Not, not as many people are thinking about having their self-published books printed. They're online, uh, they're available digitally for downloads. We used to do a lot of medical journals for doctors, but it became the case they could get them online very early and they, they all started doing that. Um, we were doing, Tedra and I were making, 10 years ago we were making maybe as many as 125 books a week, but now we, uh, we do maybe a little more high-end work and we do a little more repair of older books, but the, the basic products that we used to make, we make more like 65 or 70 books a week. Uh, it's dropped off that much. I have a feeling that ultimately I think books are going to sort of occupy the same area as vinyl records. <laughs> They're going to be collectors and people who want them and are interested, but the rest of the population will move on. <laughs> it has made um, getting the word out easier. There's no way that I would ever be able to do the custom orders that I do without the internet. It's it, I, I have shipped books to Singapore and Australia, England, Japan, I mean, all over the place, and they find me through the internet. There's no way they would find me otherwise. When I first bought the place, it was all walk-in, sort of walk-in cash and carry customers. And, and that's still the majority of what we get. But um, we've had a lot of weeks this year where I packed up and shipped half of the books that we made. Because of the internet, you can find us from anywhere in the world if, if you do the right kind of search. and. We're getting, we're getting a lot of clients, a sprinkling of them from, from all over the country and elsewhere in the world um, because it's hard to find somebody that will do this. The internet has been very helpful in that respect, I'm sure, right, it's kind of a double-edged sword. I mean, technology is taking away some of the book business, but by the same token, we wouldn't be able to reach the people we're reaching without it. And as more small, as small binderies across the country close, we tend to be gathering work from places that we never thought we would. I mean, Boston, places we would have thought there would be somebody that would do this work. We're getting work from all over the place. We kind of joke that it was a book about dying careers, things like glass blowers and blacksmiths and, and us and book binders. <laughs> Of course, we weren't sure how to take that, but she was lovely, and uh, <laughs> and we got to talk about how how books are changing, that they're they're changing, they're not dead yet. Uh, I'm not sure quite what the future holds, but um, it's true there aren't very many binderies, especially small ones in this country anymore. There there might be less than 25 now. Um, not many people doing this type of work, which is small quantities of hardcover books. We're still here. Um, it's a different mix of stuff, so we still make enough money. As I get older, uh, after 42 years of doing this, it's actually okay with me if this slows down a little bit. Um, 
I think there will be a market for some market for what we do for a very long time, but the biggest concern about all of this really is are there enough binaries like this to support the infrastructure of technology that we need to keep doing this? In other words, the mills that make these cover materials you see on all those rolls on the wall, they, that's kind of unique to this process that's actually called library binding that we use. Um, there are very few library binders left. At some point or other, those mills are going to say it's not worth the trouble anymore. And we could easily get to a point where we still have enough clients coming in the door wanting what we do, but we cannot get the things that we need to, uh, to make books. Um, so we don't know what the future holds, but that, that happens to all sorts of industries. Tedra used to work in the best film lab here in town. There is no film lab in town anymore. So things change. I know, you know, I have I, uh, one of my old high school classmates emailed one time the, the sort of the uh, a faux opening paragraph to an imagined novel. <laughs> and it was sort of like after the 11th electromagnetic wave swept over the earth, the last computers died, and suddenly a few books at a little bindery in central Illinois were worth a great deal. <laughs>